Wonderful. Well, welcome all. My name is Abby Burke. I'm the Western Rivers Regional Program Manager for Audubon Rockies. To start, uh, let me share a few housekeeping items with you. Um, we've asked and we've set the settings to keep your cameras off and to remain muted. We have a large audience and we want to preserve everyone's bandwidth. We will hold questions and answers following our presentation today and selecting those questions uh, for Dave uh, from the chat. Um, so please feel free to place questions throughout uh, to the chat. Uh, they will come to uh, my colleague, uh, Samantha Grant, uh, and myself, and we will be selecting our questions from that bank uh, for Dave. And I also want to make sure folks know that we are recording and we are also live streaming um, to Facebook for this event. Um, so again, thank you. And I want to welcome you one more time. It's a privilege to share time with you today and host award-winning conservation photographer, author, and good friend, Dave Showalter. Dave is a celebrated conservationist through how he views and shares Western landscapes, riverscapes, birds, and other wildlife. On April 1st in 2023, so just earlier this month, in partnership with Braided River and Mountaineers Books, Dave released Living River, The Promise of the Mighty Colorado. This book features stunning photography and powerful essays. Living River captures breathtaking landscapes, rich with wildlife from the upper Colorado River's tributary, the Fraser River, to the southwestern Gila and San Pedro Rivers. Along the way, Dave weaves in the stories of river keepers who work tirelessly to protect and preserve the river and its surrounding communities. I'll pop a link into the chat here shortly so you can connect more to livingrivercolorado.org. As a Colorado River professional, there is, in my humble opinion, there is no book that so richly connects watershed landscapes, people, wildlife, resilience, and the river as living river does. At a time when people want to be inspired into action to sustain the Colorado River, Living River makes a very timely debut. With Living River and the presentations based on this amazing publication, Dave seeks to take readers on a journey to see ourselves as part of nature and the community of living things, engendering empathy, caring and love for the natural world, the genesis of meaningful con conservation. As the seven states of the century old Colorado River Compact work to renegotiate the river's management guidelines for the next hundred years, Living River journeys through the endangered Colorado River from source to sea and illustrates how we can create a resilient watershed by changing our relationship with water. Dave, it's such an honor to have you here today and just thank you for sharing your time and the, your journey through creating this amazing publication. I'd love to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Abby. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Thanks everybody for being here. And while I'm sharing, I'll just say that uh, I'm grateful to Audubon for uh, supporting this before it was a, <clears throat> a complete idea. And uh, to Braided River for being behind this this idea as well from the very beginning and, and helping us to put together a lovely book and of course to Walton Family Foundation for their generous support so we can make this this robust campaign happen and this this project started about seven years ago as of right now um, just with the idea that we must always have rivers flowing through us just a little background on me I, I've done two previous long-term projects for books the first was Prairie Thunder, published in 2007 by Skyline Press. And then the second was By Braided River, our, our publisher of the Living River book. And that, that book is Sage Spirit, published in 2015 around um, the idea that uh, the greater sage grouse and, and also the Gunnison sage grouse are umbrella species for 350 other animals, including us, that rely on sagebrush in the American West. And this is kind of what it looks like for me a lot of times, uh, out a fancy dirt bag out sleeping in my truck, eating organic groceries out of a Yeti cooler uh, after a cold morning on a sage grouse leg. 
Just to kind of set the stage a little bit, plant a seed. This thin line supports 40 million of us, about 10% of the US population, all of the wild in this part of the West and feeds the nation from borderlands agricultural farms. To further set the stage, you may have heard the Colorado River is in difficulty. The deal is there's less water uh, in the system because of reduced snowpack and extreme high demand. And we have a systemic gap between the river we have and the over-promised um, nature of the Colorado River Compact, particularly in these times. We've been kind of kicking the can down the road for a long time, for decades, and now we're in difficulty. So as we look at Lake Powell and Page, Arizona and Glen Canyon Dam, Powell's at about 28%. We are in the driest period in 1,200 years and in a 23 year mega drought. Models say that we're gonna have less river in the future. So the future is quite uncertain. And that's largely why we're in this particular moment. And both Powell and Lake Mead, as you see here behind the Hoover Dam are, are uh, essential to delivering water downstream. So Powell receives the water that is sent downstream from the upper basin states, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico, sends that water through the Grand Canyon to be stored in Lake Mead, where also the water allocation for Mexico is stored. Both of those reservoirs are responsible for a, a large amount of power generation. And, uh, and we're scrambling now to figure out how to balance these waters so that we don't have a collapse in the lower basin states of California, Arizona, and Nevada are wholly dependent on these waters. And it's bracing when we look at scenes like this, a 60s speedboat turned on end, was under 150 feet of water just a couple of years ago. Uh, last spring, a year ago, folks in the Las Vegas area watched the waters recede. They dubbed this boat the Las Vegas Sundial, which is kind of a funny spin on a, a pretty serious uh, situation. And, and in July, when I made this picture on a 108 degree evening, uh, Lake Mead was at its low point of all time. And we also know that the river, about 80% of the river goes to agriculture. Here we are in the Yuma agricultural fields. There's three major industrial agricultural fields on the borderlands, Yuma, Imperial Valley, California, and Mexicali, just on the other side of the border from Imperial Valley. So if you're eating a salad in North America, you're most likely eating the Colorado River from these Yuma lettuce fields. And these are some of the oldest water rights on the river. Uh, about a third of the river goes to alfalfa to feed cattle. And at this point, I, I'm not gonna comment on crop mix, that sort of thing, market dynamics. But everybody's going to share in the cuts that are coming because there's less water in the system, including the agricultural users. And the only tool we have to recalibrate for these users is, and, and to have water for the downstream folks in those lower basin states is demand. We have to recalibrate demand. We have to use less water. And everybody, all 40 million of us are gonna share in that as we go forward. And we have big questions to ask, like the Central Arizona Project or the Cap Canal, which runs from Parker Dam by Lake Havasu and supports life in Phoenix and Tucson, runs through the open desert. What are we going to do with the Cap? There's, that's, a, that's a big drain on the system. But have you been to the river? And that's kind of where my story comes in. Have you been to the river and witnessed the Colorado River at its headwaters flowing from the Never Summer Range in Rocky Mountain National Park on a cool spring morning. Have you seen where the Green River begins as a river of ice in glaciers in the Wind River Range where four major river systems begin in a mountain range that is where rivers are born? Have you stood along the Grand Canyon, uh, the Colorado River in the bottom of the Grand Canyon and felt her power and intention to reach the sea and taken in a third of the world's history from this sacred space? Have you floated under the Tiger Wall in Dinosaur National Monument on the Yampa River and felt compelled to kiss the wall because river lore says that'll give you safe passage through the rapids downstream? Have you seen where the river doubles back on itself? And as we look into the twilight blue waters of the Gila River in Southwest New Mexico, it's really our relationship to water that must change, how we see rivers, how we see them flowing through us in our own lives. 
my journey officially began seven years ago. My, prior to that, my wife Marla had been roaming these Rocky Mountains for, for decades. And that, all of that has informed this journey. And in 2011, we had made several attempts to reach the top of James Peak over 13,000 feet in the headwaters and had blown off, been blown off in an extraordinarily windy winter. And then we made it on the last day of, of winter in 2011. And when, stand, when I was standing there on top of James Peak, I looked north to Long's Peak, the highest place in Rocky Mountain National Park, and across all of these rivers, ridges covered in snow. And I realized in that moment that this is all the water we have for the coming year, that everything to the right or east side will flow to the Platte Basin, Denver and beyond, and everything to the left or west side will flow to the Fraser River, first tributary of the Colorado, and to the Colorado in its headwaters. And that was a really powerful moment. And interestingly, 2011 is the closest analog we have to this particular season where we've had good snowpack. And so we're gonna get some temporary relief from that snowpack. Um, but we, we need to be mindful and hold our horses because we are indeed in a 23 year mega drought. And these, these headwaters are wonderful places to just roam and explore and feel the purity of a, of a, of a Colorado winter and to, to go search for ptarmigan. White-tailed ptarmigan are our smallest grouse species in North America. They spend their whole life above timberline. They survive winter in the Rocky Mountains by burying themselves in snow for insulation and eating little tiny chia seed-sized willow buds uh, for survival. And they're just, they're just wonderful creatures and camouflage specialists. And similarly, the American pika, uh, although a completely different animal, of course, relies on snowpack for their own survival. They are not hibernating. They are underneath the Rocky Mountain snowpack right now, feeding the, the snowpack gives them insulation and they're feeding on that larder of hay of forbs and grasses that they gathered from the alpine tundra over the summer months. So in a sense, both of these animals are wholly dependent on snowpack for their survival, just as we are. Looking at Winter Park ski area in the headwaters on the lower right part of the frame, there's a collection point, and there are diversion structures in every crease in these mountains that divert water. And a lot of that water goes to the collection point and into the Moffat Tunnel, there are two bores. There's a train bore and a water bore. 60% of the Fraser River, again, the first tributary of the Colorado is sent through the water bore to join South Boulder Creek. And it goes on to Denver to power Denver's economy and water lawns and golf courses and so forth. And there are uh, a number of cities in this part of the West that receive trans basin diversions. This is the Fraser River diversion is a trans mountain diversion where the water's flushed right through the Rocky Mountains. Um, and so, you know, the, the cities are doing better on their water consumption, but the question we need to be asking is, are we doing everything we can? Because indeed the river is in crisis and we all need to share in that. And as you look at this map on the outskirts, you see Albuquerque, San Diego, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Denver, all of these cities are re receiving trans basin diversions, meaning we're sending water out of the Colorado River Basin to, to fuel these cities' economies. And, um, and we all just need to, to do the best we possibly can. We've, we've created these maps with Braided River all in this same style. This one has the upper and lower basin in accordance with the 1922 Colorado River Compact, which governs how the waters are, of the Colorado are allocated and shows major points that are uh, referenced in the text. We also show at the bottom of the frame that the river reaches the sea. And indeed this river reached the sea for 6 million years up until about 1960 when it started to dry out in Mexico. And we'll get into that. Uh, later on in the presentation. But this is another way to look at a watershed. All of those arteries and veins that are streams and tributary rivers flowing to the big river, the Colorado. And imagine all of that pulse and energy as the water is released from the mountains in spring when the snowpack melts, all of that rhythm and pulse and flow. And the reason I show this frame is because we are made of rhythm and pulse and flow. And in that sense, there's no separation between us and this river. We owe our lives to. We meet our first river keeper in the headwaters. Kirk Clanky is the Trout Unlimited chapter, headwaters chapter president. 
Kirk has a, a he's been 30 plus years in that role and is, is just a force for, for good in the headwaters and a community builder bringing people together. And Kirk has a saying that com conservation begins with a conversation. One of those con conversations was about the, the Fraser River. You can see James Peak in the distance, the headwaters that we looked at a bit ago. Uh, in the Fraser River, Kirk had a long conversation over decades with Denver Water and things started to change and a learning, learning by doing group was formed. And that group was is still active, of course, Trout Unlimited, Denver Water, which has a significant right to these waters, even though they're on the other side of the mountains, and uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And what they did here is they restored the health of this stretch of the Fraser River and they established point bars and, um, and, and channel boundaries and dredged out the channel. There was heavy equipment in the river. They pl replanted new willow. And I was able to go on a biomass study uh, a couple of years ago where we had all of these entities in the water together, plus high school kids and volunteers were shocking fish and then were measuring those fish and documenting the results. And what we discovered was that there is fresh fry, fresh trout fry in this Willow Flats stretch of the river. And so fish are reproducing and there's a healthy aquatic insect population and healthy sculpin population. And the birds are responding too. In May, the yellow warblers are singing their heads off, protecting nesting territories in restored willow. So restoration works and engenders hope and brings people together. And the Colorado River is humble in its headwaters. You can jump across it in the summertime as it leaves the Rocky Mountains and goes on its journey. And in these headwaters, American dippers are only aquatic songbird. They love the turbulent, clean waters. They're a clean water indicator species uh, in the headwaters. And they actually dive for their food, just like trout do, and eat the same stuff trout does. This guy grabbed a nice gob of uh, insect, aquatic insect larvae off the side of a rock. Really wonderful birds. Fire is a big issue in the headwaters. The East Troublesome Fire late in 2020, when it should have been snowing in October, driven by hot winds, uh, was a firestorm that rolled through Rocky Mountain National Park on the west side, crested the Rocky Mountains, threatened the town of Estes Park. Here, uh, a couple of months later, Monument Plant is starting to reclaim the forest floor. And you can see that this was um, an erratic, really hot, um, wind-driven storm and rock, the, the Colorado River is flowing out of Rocky Mountain National Park here from right to left and into Sun Valley Estates and it completely wiped out this human development at, at Sun Valley Estates and those are the never summer range in the headwaters beyond. The Green River begins at in the Wind River Range as we saw a moment ago and here we are at the very headwaters where the green flows out of Peak Lake. Around the corner to the left is Stroud Glacier, and that's the official headwaters of the green. So this is the biggest tributary of the Colorado, about 700 miles long, and the green meets the Colorado in Canyonlands National Park. And it flows through some, the green flows out of the wilderness and through some farmlands and hits the first dam or the, the northernmost dam in the stair-stepped uh, system of, of dams and reservoirs to control the Colorado River. So here's the green at, at Fontenelle Dam and Reservoir. And when Fontenelle was created, Seedskitty National Wildlife Refuge was created as a mitigation refuge to replace that habitat. Here, Tom Kerner is the refuge manager, great guy, uh, willing to try lots of experimental treatments for the health of the river. He uses his photography to showcase showcase his own reservoir, I mean his own refuge. Um, and uh, and Tom just, he's a great friend and, and is doing incredible work here at, on an overlook of the Green River in Seedskiddy, which the name Seedskiddy is a mountain man derivation of the word Siskiddy Aja, which is a Shoshone word meaning river of the sage grouse. And on several consecutive mornings in early summer, I, I watched these sage grouse gather in this very spot and they flew over a wet meadow. Uh, interestingly enough, below an eagle nest, here the three chicks are, are hanging out waiting for their next meal, which ended up being a white sucker and everybody got all excited. 
But uh, what sage grouse do here is they bring their broods in the summer of chicks and they raise them along the shores of the Green River. The dam upstream keeps the river open in winter, so it's uh, a really important spot for uh, trumpeter swans, our largest waterfowl species. 300 trumpeter swans uh, over winter on the, on the Green River in Seedskadee, so very much a stronghold for these remarkable birds and wonderful to, to witness them through the winter months. And then they stick around, about a dozen pairs stick around and uh, breed and raise their young at Seedskadee. But there's another phenomenon. When you have a dam upstream, the, the river doesn't flood anymore because it's so controlled. And you need those spring floods for the health of woody vegetation along our rivers. Here, Russ is trimming willow stakes to be staked into the, into the banks of the Green River um, and, and uh, to re recover that really important woody uh, vegetation for birds and, and really a lot of animals eat, eat willow. So this is a super important uh, mitigation strategy. And similarly, cottonwoods, cottonwoods are very difficult um, to restore because it is said they need their toes in water or their roots in water. And it's an ongoing major challenge beneath all of these these dams in the Colorado River system. And then on one trip, I met a, a fisherman and he, 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 he showed me, I, I, I arrived at Seedskadee and he showed me this picture on his phone that he had taken of a bobcat when, while floating past a bluff on the green. And, and I just kind of scrapped my plans and I went looking for this bobcat. And I spent about a week looking for the bobcat, uh, found her uh, late in my trip and had this magical evening with her against a Wyoming sunset. And turned out she had three kittens. This is one of those kittens walking confidently along the ridge on the bluff. And I watched in, in darkness almost this kitten nursing on the face of this bluff. But the cool thing that happened during that week was I, I ran into all sorts of other kinds of wildlife while I was looking for this, for this bobcat. And I had prairie falcons screeching overhead and saw that they were on a scrape over the Green River, bringing in prey items to their young that were on that scrape. And so they were feeding them chipmunks and uh, ground squirrels, which I thought about it a little bit. So they were gathering these prey items from the sage at the top of the bluff. And these would have been the same prey items that the bobcats would have been hunting for to feed their own young. And this is that bluff on a side channel of the Green River in Seedskadee uh, Nas National Wildlife Refuge. Really magical, beautiful country. River otters are a clean water indicator in Seedskadee. They eat a lot of crayfish and American whitefish in this case, and white suckers. And they're doing quite well in Seedskadee. See a lot of otters. Kokanee salmon run upstream. They're, they're an introduced species, but what they do is they run upstream from Flaming Gorge Reservoir and they spawn and die in, the, in Seedskadee. And they leave a lot of biomass that is preyed upon by many, many species. So they kind of do some good, even though they're not native. And then going south, Southeast Utah into Bears Ears. In 2019, I attended the Bears Ears Summer Gathering which is the Five Tribe Coalition for the Protection of Bears Ears National Monument. And the five tribes, elders of the five tribes are in this teepee. There was a steady drumbeat all night long. I, I heard it when I woke up at four o'clock the next morning. They held ceremony through the night and it, it was a very impactful experience for me. And I was there because I was trying to sort out what sort of indigenous story I might tell as part of this project. The Bears Ears are two sandstone buttes that rise above the, the desert in Southeast Utah. Here we are at 8,000 feet in the sage, just a wonderful place to be in the summertime. And we know Bears Ears largely for the ancestral dwellings and archeological record of the ancient Pueblo, ancestral Puebloans, the ancient ones. Really wonderful spaces. This is in the canyons of Cedar Mesa in Bears Ears. The San Juan River, which carved these goosenecks in, in entrenched meanders, borders Bears Ears to the south. You can see Monument Valley 
further off in the distance to the south, so that that extent this view extends into Arizona. And pathways led me to Cynthia Wilson, who is Navajo Dene, and Cynthia is a, a co-founder of the Women of Bears Ears. She's an indigenous leader. I met her and spent time with her wonderful family. Here she's holding sprouting Bears Ears potatoes, which were grown by the ancestors in her Hogan, which is the womb of Mother Earth. And a really cool thing about how Bears Ears boundaries were created was it was by mapping the vegetation plots of the indigenous ancestors. I was introduced to Ann Castle. She formerly worked in the Obama administration under in the and ran the Bureau of Reclamation and the US Geological Survey. She's uh, she told me I'm flunking retirement. And then she was appointed by Joe Biden uh, to be the commissioner of the Upper Colorado River Basin um, renegotiation talks. And I know Anne as a friend and someone who helped guide my journey during the pandemic. Anne saw a strong need for water for tribes because many uh, tribal communities have no access to clean water. She joined forces with Betta, Bitta Becker, her Navajo Dene colleague, and they formed the Universal Rights to Clean Water for Tribal Communities campaign. And it's a wonderful campaign. The, it's uh, tribalcleanwater.org is where you can go to learn about that. But I thank Anne for introducing me to this business of, of tribes not having access to clean water. And I sought to make a few images to show what that looks like. This is Henry Wilson Sr. Cynthia's father at the Monument Valley Water Collection Station. You can see it's a tiny garden hose. There's five trucks in line. It takes about a half hour to fill a 325 gallon tank. So this was a two and a half or three hour line just to gather water for the day. And then the water gets distributed at home to horses, sheep, traditional foods garden, and the rest for the family. Eloise, uh, the mom, is, Cynthia's mom is in the foreground. And then Cynthia, Jayana and Brandon are in the, in the background. They tried the drip system. It didn't quite deliver the water evenly. So they uh, went back to watering by hand. Lots of hard work. And we had a celebratory moment about a month later, I went back and corn was knee high. And uh, I just wanna say these people are so wonderful and kind and generous and welcoming. And I'm, I'm just extremely grateful um, to the indigenous folks that I, I worked with to tell this story for welcoming me into their lives. In Southwest New Mexico, the Gila River flows from the Mogollon Range underneath a canopy of cottonwoods. The, the Mogollon Mountains here are in the Gila Wilderness, our largest wilderness area, our first wilderness area. And uh, this is magical country as well. Martha Cooper from the Nature Conservancy runs uh, the Gila Farm and the Nature Conservancy out of the Gila Farm. Martha is a community builder. The Gila Farm has, has, uh, has a water right. So they, they have a seat at the table with the irrigators in the valley. Martha worked with the, the irrigators and the community and together they fought and won and stopped a dam in the headwaters of the Gila, which is one of the most wildlife rich places anywhere in North America. Sandhill cranes on the Gila Farm in this frame. And this would have been <laughs> would have been a reservoir, uh, but thanks to Mar Martha and and uh, all the wonderful folks in the valley, uh, it the Gila is wild and free flowing and just incredible. And, and here you see part of what makes it incredible is these wonderful cottonwood gallery forests that stretch out in the Gila floodplain and give life to so many species. High in the Gila wilderness are the Gila cliffs, and that's where the Mogollon people made their homes during the same time that the ancestral Puebloans were in Bears Ears. It's a flashy or flash flood prone river. Beavers build their lodges in holes in the banks and just a wonderful, extraordinary place for birds. The Penapepla is called the black cardinal, but they're not really a cardinal. They're their own species and genus. Quatamundi are fruit eaters, uh, raccoon relatives. This guy is in a, a desert hawthorn, hawthorn tree. 
really cool animals. And Southwest willow flycatchers are quite endangered. They depend on healthy cottonwood and willow. And that, that becomes a recurrent theme throughout this story. And they arrive in June and very rapidly along with uh, yellow-billed cuckoos set up their nests and fledge their young before the summer monsoon season. The Gila always seems to give a gift. I was just departing, I was packing up and then these cranes lifted off. Uh, they, they were kind of hidden in tall grasses and flew across this wonderful uh, backdrop of, of autumn colors of, of sycamore and cottonwood. Just a little over to the west, this is Holly Richter, a hydrologist at the time working for the Nature Conservancy there on the San Pedro River. The San Pedro is one of two rivers that flow south to north and cross the border. And it's also a tributary of the Gila. And Gila's, or, uh, Holly's <laughs> concern is groundwater uh, in this space. We're, you can see the at the top of the frame, the cottonwoods where the San Pedro crosses the border. Um, there, there's no animals for the most part can cross this border. It's all been reworked and industrialized. There's a bridge and lights over the river, which is problematic for songbirds that migrate at night and other species that, that need the darkness of night. A turtle can't cross this wall, ne never mind a, a jaguar or, a, or an ocelot or a black bear or any number of other species. So it's tough. And the deal here is that there are long stretches uh, on this flashy river. You can see wood piled up on the right-hand side from the big flash floods that happened during monsoon season. But the rest of the year, it's a pretty quiet river. And there's big stretches that are dry. And here you're looking at the very water table of the San Pedro River. It doesn't look like much, but this is a hemispherically important place for birds. And so what has to happen and what Holly has been engaged in is building community so that gray water gets infiltrated into the underground aquifer, raises the groundwater, so it raises the water table. And uh, we've, we've written the, the details of all of that into the book, but um, it's just a super important river. And it's, it's a wonderful story that the whole community is engaged. And groundwater pumping is nothing new. This is this is how it was for, for a long time until the centrifugal pump came along. And in, in the rural spaces of Arizona, groundwater is a big issue since the centrifugal pump, 40 straight years of unfettered groundwater pump, pumping has imperiled a, a lot of spaces in Southern Arizona. Also in Southern Arizona are 50 plus Sky Island mountain ranges, each with their own several biomes as you go up in elevation. Here we're looking at a wonderful grassland at the top of Coronado Peak in Coronado National Memorial. The border is border wall is off to the upper left, and then all of that beyond is is Mexico, where the San Pedro River begins. Each of those biomes holds their own range of species. Here we're looking at a coos deer. It's a white white-tailed deer relative, an elfin deer that's only a little over waist tall. And as you can see, has stunning eyelashes against a backdrop of, of wonderful autumn colors that would rival New England because of the bare tooth maple. And here you can see the, the origins of Ramsey Creek, uh, a, a really important bird area in the San Pedro watershed where sycamore and, and cottonwood are uh, lining the creek as it leaves the Huachuca Mountains. So with all the challenges, the birds are still here like this Gila woodpecker on a cottonwood in the San Pedro floodplain. I flew with Lighthawk. I did all my flight flights with Lighthawk, a wonderful conservation group uh, with volunteer pilots. I flew with Lighthawk on this flight over the Grand Canyon, mostly for this picture, because in the lower left, that mesa was to have a big tourist development on it that would have also ran a gondola down to the sacred confluence the Colorado is in shadow here, but that's the confluence of the Little Colorado and the Colorado. And it's the birthplace of the Hopi people, the current homeland of the Navajo Diné, and all the tribes of the region have a sacred connection to this place. Thankfully, that development did not, not get built. I also wanted to look at this uranium mine, the canyon mine that's 
only 10 miles from the, the rim of the Grand Canyon and uh, threatens seeps and, and the water structure underground. And uh, also another note, there's all, over 500 abandoned uranium mines on Navajo lands in this part of the world. I float with, uh, with Audubon Rockies. I've done three raft trips and there is absolutely nothing like floating beneath these walls of time at the pace of a river in the Grand Canyon. Here we see the, the little Colorado, the, the blue waters are from a, uh, mineral deposits from a spring upstream, sacred space. Peering into a slot canyon, the Deer Creek slot canyon in the Grand Canyon. And uh, condors are, are doing better in the Grand Canyon region. They are introduced, introduced by uh, the Peregrine Fund on Vermilion Cliffs nearby. Uh, this guy I photographed in Zion National Park. And this pair had had the 1,000th chick hatched in ca captivity. You can see this guy still has a black head. So California condor chick. Um, a side note is that recently there have been something like 20 mortalities in Southern California of California condors because of avian bird flu. So something to be watchful of. And uh, this is Marla Ofsted, my wife in the Grand Canyon in 2018. We had a wonderful backpacking trip with our friends Emma and Joe. What a joyful time. Marla was a powerhouse on that trip. And then a year and a half later was diagnosed with li liposarcoma, uh, the rarest form of cancer. Here she is in Escalante. Marla, <clears throat> Marla fought so hard through 20 very difficult chemo treatments. And, uh, and she was brave and courageous and never gave up hope for one second. She had clean scans in 2021. And on January 1st, 2021, we were able to go forward with our, our tradition of, of leaving in the dark and hiking up in the dark on snowshoes into the headwaters to welcome sunrise of a new year. And she was super strong again, and we were full of hope, but the cancer came back and there were more treatments and more surgeries. And although Marla never gave up hope, she ran out of time on May 20th, 2022. And she was joy and love and life and enlightened. As a couple, we, fl we flowed like a river. And her loss is a seismic loss to me. Excuse me. <clears throat> Marla had a saying, you just got to keep going. And she believed in this project fully. She believed in me before I even had fully formed the, the idea of how I was going to tell this story. She loved this project and she loved being a part of it. And she was a huge, huge part of it. She still is. So what was I to do? I had one chapter left to finish. I harnessed some of that love and energy from Marla. And I reached out to Jennifer Pitt, a uh, longtime leader in Audubon and leader in conservation in the Colorado River Delta, and asked Jen Jennifer if I could interview her for the Colorado River Delta chapter. She graciously agreed, and she she gave all the knowledge and history and texture and grit and all the connections uh, that actually became, her interview became Colorado River Delta chapter. And then I went to Mexico and this was July of last year. <laughs> when I reached out to the local conservation group, they said, nobody's ever asked to come here in July, but I had a chapter to do. I flew with Lighthawk again. On the left side of the frame is, is Yuma, is the US side, and then there's the border, Los Algodones, Mexico on the right side. And you can see where the river hits the Morales Dam and gets shunted off to the right to go to Mexicali, which, and, and the little tiny bit of the river is left just to the right-hand side of the border there, that little trickle in the floodplain. But this is largely why it is said the river dries up in Mexico, but that's not true. It's not fair. The Siena did, 
Cienega de Santa Clara, the wetland, is, uh, is an extraordinarily important place for birds that was created by an accidental leak from a pipe on the US side. And now it's a critically important place that looks like the lagoons of the Colorado River originally looked. And I met with Pro Natura Nareste with Dylan and Mary Lou. They are part of the Raise the River Alliance. So um, a binational coalition to restore habitat in the Colorado River floodplain and nudge the river forward to reach the sea again. Dylan's holding a willow plant, Mary Lou a cottonwood plant in a greenhouse in a restoration site uh, on the Colorado River floodplain in Mexico. This is what those restoration sites look like before they're restored. Lots of garbage and invasive species. And then you go to the Miguel Alleman site, which is now 10 years old. When, when this was first scraped clean, it had 10 bird, uh, it had, this was 10 years ago, it had 23 bird species. And now 10 years later has 123 bird species. So there's tons of hope in restoration in Mexico. Looking at the Chasse site, um, you can see mature cottonwood gallery forest and nature is really responding. Some 18 million birds on migration cross the Colorado River Delta every spring. And when we look into these tidal waters on the Delta, yes, I know it's tidal waters, but I, I also see the hopeful impression in the historic river channel of the Colorado reaching the sea again. And, it, and in these dendritic patterns, it's almost like the river is reaching for the sea. So is there hope for the Colorado River? Of course there's hope. I wouldn't be doing this story and telling it if there wasn't hope. 40 million people are still supported by this river system that also feeds the nation. And I think, you know, there's going to be big cuts, as I mentioned at the outset. We have less water in the system, certainly, and there's going to be big challenges ahead. But we can weather this if more people are engaged and more people care. And there's lots of ways to engage. And Audubon um, certainly is a great resource for that. And you you heard about a number of river keepers who are doing incredible work. And we have a resource page in the book for, for engagement. What I want people to do is go to the river. I want you to go to the river, where, wherever that is for you, and be present with her and take in her life force and her strength and her power and to start see our, seeing ourselves as a part of the river, not separate from it. And if enough of us do that, we start to become the river. And the power in that is then we become a voice for the Colorado River because we can't go through this tough period and not consider the health of the river as part of this recalibration. And it's up to us to be that voice. So become, become the river, go to the river, we are the river. Thank you.